Okay, great. So good morning. I uh, glad to all see you all here early on a Friday morning. Hopefully you had your coffee. If you can't hear me in the back, uh, wave, and I'll just yell louder. You can't hear me. All right, I'll put this on. So let me ask, when I as I do this, how many of you are uh, power on? How many of you are uh, students here at, at uh, University of Illinois? Okay. How many of you are undergraduates? How many of you are graduates? How many, uh, now I want to figure out what flavor you are. Uh, how many of you are, I'll start with my own, how many of you are electrical engineering? How many of you are bioengineering? How many of you are physics? Oh, how many of you are chemistry? What have I left out? How many of you are psychology majors? <laughs> no. Okay, that's all right. I don't talk too much about psychology. Uh, is this on? No, it's on. Okay, so this is meant to be an introduction, uh, which means that I'll uh, give you a survey of what I would call nanophotonics, but it's, it's a bit biased because I have my own, my own interests, my own bias. And then there'll be two more talks uh, this morning, who will, they'll also be talking about biophotonics, I should say uh, nanophotonics, but they'll in one case be a bio slant, one case will be maybe plasmonic, so we'll all have a little bit different perspective, but this is meant to be an introduction, which means that I'll probably put stuff up here that some of you will have already seen before, and some of you have never seen before, so I will be equally boring and exciting you uh, at the same time. So let me start out. What, are, what is photonics? Photonics is an area that a research area that I'm in, um, and this is something that we generally uh, define as anything to do with light. Um, and in recent years, meaning the last 30 years, that has increasingly been interconnected with information. We live in the information age, and all of you who are sitting here uh, checking your email this morning are using photonics because when you go off to the internet, when you place your cell phone and text someone, that information is being distributed by uh, optical fiber. So photonics is a generation, transmission, modulation, switching, amplification, blah, 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 of light. And the key word in this is photon. Photon is part, one of the important parts of nanophotonics, but the photon is the fundamental quanta of light. And so even though it's extremely quantum mechanical. From the most part, we uh, typically look at this as a classical, uh, classical phenomena. So what is nanophotonics? Uh, well, that just means really photonics because the, the photon itself has a wavelength in the visible in, in free space which is something less than a micron. It's a couple hundred uh, uh, microns, like nanometers. So nano means anything on the nanometer scale, and so typically for most of what we talk about in photonics, it's already on the nanometer scale. So let's get calibrated. Um, in some sense, the, what I want to talk about is the interaction between light and matter, because that's what we're, really, uh, what we're really trying to do. In some cases, we're trying to sense matter. In some cases, we're trying to use matter to transmit, generate, or detect light, uh, manipulate light, and in some cases, we're using matter to generate light. So matter is a big term, but I really only care about one thing, an electron. So that the very basic essence of this, uh, of nanophotonics, is the interaction between an electron and a photon. Two very fundamental particles. So let's talk about the length scale. Uh, if we're talking about matter, uh, you know, a couple meters, that'd be me, uh, and you, you know, there's a lot of electrons in us. But we can scale down, you know, a centimeter, you know, the size of a cell, about a micron. Um, and you know DNA and then uh, modern transistors uh, typically have a gate uh, oxide that's on the order of a uh, nanometer or less where you can literally count the number of atoms. And really what we want when we talk about the interaction between light and matter we're really talking about the interaction between light and matter 
with the electrons, the valence electrons in the material. Okay, so light is a little uh, uh, length scale of, of, you know, I really should call this electromagnetic radiation because as human beings, we're, so, we're sort of, uh, we discriminate. We say that, oh, this teeny weeny little narrow bandwidth between uh, about 400 to uh, 700 nanometers of wave of light of e m radiation is something that we call light that's just because we can see it that's what our eyeballs are are sensitive to and it really has more to do with chemistry because when you look around outside what do you see you see green why chlorophyll this planet is basically a giant uh, uh, consumption of, uh, of photons in the green wavelength that uh, you know convert and you know grow corn and soybeans and make all the car farmers around there happy, um, but really electromagnetic radiation you know spans the whole gamut all the way from very 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 short wavelength gamma rays X rays, uh, you know this teeny narrow wavelength range that we call visible, and then the long wavelength, the uh, what we call the infrared wavelengths which would be between say a micron to maybe two or three microns. That's of real interest. It's a real interest. For technologically, for technological reasons, turns out that 1.5 micron light has the lowest attenuation in silica, optical fiber. So, you know, you want to send uh, information long distance, you want to use 1.5 microns. Um, many uh, in, in chemical reactions, uh, many many things, you know, the folding uh, uh, bonding states and so forth, the, the 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 vibration states. These are in the infrared. So these are also of interest for sensing applications. And then if you get it really long, uh, we can talk about radio waves, microwaves, you know, when you call on your cell phone. All right, so nanophotonics is a relatively recent uh, uh, area. I think it was really defined in the, uh, in the late 1990s simply because then President Clinton decided, oh, we're going to do nano uh, technology, and so everything got nano on the front end of it. So we had photonics, and then we have nanophotonics. But it turns out that this has been a, I don't know if I call it technology, but this has been around for a long time, probably all the way back to the dinosaurs. And some uh, particular uh, examples of this are, are uh, butterflies and peacocks. Uh, butterflies. When you see those beautiful uh, ever, ever, iridescent butterfly wings, you know, and they, when you, when they're kind of fluttering, and you look at them at different angles, they change colors. That is due to the fact that there's actually a structure in the wing that looks a lot like what we'll call a photonic crystal. That, in fact, looking at different angles, you have different reflection properties of light back at you. Similarly for the, uh, the peacock, the male peacock, you know, when he's trying to scare away things, he puts up his, uh, his uh, uh, feathers, and up in the feathers are these things that are supposed to look like eyes. And if, you, and if you ever look at that, and you look at it at different angles, again, you'll see that what you see changes as a function of angle. And that's because it has this, what we call, inverse opal structure. And again, a photonic crystal structure. So many of the things that uh, we do in nanophotonics um, we, uh, we are essentially borrowing from nature. All right, so this is what I want to talk about. I fundamentally am going to talk about the interaction between the electron and the photon, because that's, that's what photonics is. That's what the interaction between light and matter is. We don't care about how light interacts with the nucleus. Uh, we don't uh, care, um, well, I have to be careful. Maybe if you're in high energy physics, you would care about how a gamma ray interacts with the nucleus. But in, in terms of photonics, uh, we typically are, it's, it's, the, it's the electron, the valence electron, and the photon that we care about. So what I'm going to do for this overview is just tell you how we tame these two things. How do we confine the photon and the electron? And it turns out that uh, even though these are two v dissimilar fundamental particles, they, the way we can find them, they're, they're similarities. We'll talk about using dielectric structures, periodic structures, and uh, most recently, metallic structures for the confinement of either an electron or a photon, and in many applications, both. Okay, so uh, 
just to uh, a little more on the lane scale, we, uh, we have this electromagnetic radiation. And as you know, a photon, as you maybe know, uh, as physicists in here know, a photon is a fundamental quanta of light. But light itself is this physical uh, phenomena that we have two, two fields, an electromagnetic, uh, electric field and magnetic field that propagate perpendicular uh, to the uh, direction of propagation of the, of the, of the entity um, and has a number of quantities. One of those would be the wavelength. We can talk about the wavelength of light. Uh, typically, we'll uh, look at units of nanometer. So red is 670 nanometers, blue, 450 nanometers. And I, that's about all the only two that I know. Uh, green is somewhere in between. Um, but wavelength is one quanta. We can also think of it in terms of energy. As, as we know, a photon carries a quanta of energy. Okay, it's a massless particle, but it has energy. The energy we can very conveniently remember that the, the energy measured in units of electron volts if we know the wavelength in microns, it's this is very convenient uh, relationship where uh, energy is 1.24 divided by its wavelength in microns. 1.24, it's just basically a uh, Planck's constant and the speed of light and electric charge uh, that, that comes up to that, that this particular number when we use these units. So we have wavelength, we have energy, but we can also talk about frequency. Frequency is all, is, it, these are all three just different names of the same, same, uh, same uh, information. We typically don't use frequency when we describe light, although interestingly enough, this is probably one of the most fundamental properties because the wavelength will depend a lot on the material that it's propagating through. Uh, but frequency is constant. But Typically, frequencies are in the terahertz range. They're in such a high frequency that it's kind of hard to, to think in those big numbers. So we usually don't think in terms of frequency. Uh, it's usually energy. If you're a physicist, it's energy. And if you're a photonics person, it's typically wavelength. All right. So what does you know, nanophotonics, you know, when, when, are, when are we in the regime of nanophotonics and when are we in classical optics? Well, I mentioned that the wavelength of visible light are in the hundreds of nanometers. So we can use the wavelength as a scale. So we can say, when the feature size of whatever we're talking about, if we're talking about, say, a optical fiber that's 100 kilometers long, or we're talking about the shadow that you cast on the floor, well, that feature is 100 kilometers long, or, I don't know, 2.1 you know, meters tall, that's probably pretty tall, 1.7 meters tall. That's, that is something that's you know, way bigger than the wavelength. That's what we're gonna call the classical optics regime. All right, this is, this is Maxwell's equations. Maxwell's equations are, uh, are what guide uh, the, uh, the propagation of light. We can talk about structures that are essentially at the same scale, the same length scale as light, okay? These, you see these all the time. Uh, if you, uh, none of you have one, but if you whip out a, a, a compact disc and you look at it, especially look at it in the sunlight, you'll notice that you get a very cool looking uh, uh, surface when you look at that surface because that surface is actually patterned on the wavelength scale of light. It's a grating. So when you, when you have features that are on the, on the, on the wavelength scale, we would, this, is at the, this is at the border between classical optics and nanophotonics. Uh, but there's a lot of interesting things. We'll talk about photonic crystals, talk about gratings, uh, phased array uh, phenomena, uh, whether it's uh, radar or, uh, or uh, photonics. Uh, these, these, these features are on the scale of light. And then we can talk about features that are much smaller than the wavelength. And this is clearly into the nanophotonic regime. Um, and this is probably one of the areas that's really growing, in particular, um, metamaterials, which you'll, I think you'll hear more about in the, uh, in the next discussion. Materials where we don't rely on Mother Nature to design our, the materials, we design the materials to, to produce the output properties that we want to see. All right, so what is an electron? Uh, electron is a uh, elementary particle, which means you can't divide it any smaller. Uh, and it's something that we call a fermion. 
uh, fermion, which means that it has a half, it's a, part, a quantum mechanical particle with spin one half. What does that really mean? Well, this really means that we can take electrons and we can start building materials. Now we know that an electron comes with a, with a proton, but I don't really care about the nucleus because I'm really talking about the interaction between light and matter. So I just really care about the, the electron cloud around, around atoms. So even though I'll talk about this, I'll talk about materials in terms of their electron, of course there's the, the positive part of, that goes along with it. But we can take an electron and we can, we can build atoms. We can start putting electrons together. Right? And we know that the electrons can only occupy one state. That the next electron has to take a different state. That's because they're a fermion. This is very different for a photon. But this gives rise to you know, some amazing things. One is, is that we can, uh, we can talk about the electron states, the cloud, the, the, the probability distribution of the electrons around the atom. And they're not all the same, that as we fill electrons into, a, into an atom, as you start building materials, they have different, different profiles. And we can calculate them. This is, this is what you do in atomic physics. And this all happens because of the Pauli exclusion principle, because these are fermions. And it's because of this that we have the, the, the uh, periodic chart, that we can build up all the different materials that we have in the world. Okay, that's the electron. Elementary charge, elementary particle charged, spin one half. Okay, what's a photon? See, I'm comparing these two, these two things. Photon is elementary particle, has a oscillating electric and magnetic field. It is a boson. That does not mean it is less intelligent than an electron. It simply means that it has a, part, a uh, spin of one, of, a, of, a, of an integer. <coughs> This means that it's, it uh, satisfies completely different um, uh, principles in terms of the interaction between uh, photons. The electrons, we know they don't get along. That only one electron can be in a state at a time. That the next electron has to be in a different state. They are exclusive to each other. Photons are inclusive. They, you can put as many photons in a state as you want. They're, they're bosons. And so this gives rise to the fact that they do not interact. They do not interact with each other. It's, they could care less about each other, unlike the electron. This makes the, the, the behavior very, di very different. Uh, and you know these satisfy the so-called Bose-Einstein uh, statistics. But what that, what that really means on a technological pr perspective is the things that in, in materials, we rely on the exclusion principle to give us the rich diversity of materials. You know, all the way from hydrogen to plutonium. Well, even bigger, I don't, that's. Uh, but, but photons, they, uh, they can be, they, they don't interact. So for example, we have a piece of optical fiber, we can put more than one frequency of light down that fiber and they don't care. This is very important to you because this is, the, this is how the, the internet has been able to keep up with our bandwidth demands and the expansion across the globe. Because we can, on the same piece, of, same piece of fiber, we can put more and more and more information. We can't do that with a piece of copper. A piece of copper, you put an electron in it, the next electron interacts with the previous electron. So you can't have independent channels of, of uh, data based on, uh, on charge. But you can photons. Okay, so photon uh, electron interaction, uh, as I mentioned, we don't really care. Uh, the, the energies it takes to, uh, to perturb the nucleus is, is really, really high. So that's way into the, the, you know, the gamma ways and so forth. Um, so really it's, it's sort of x-ray to, to uh, infrared and really think infrared that interact, that have the kind of energies that interact with, the, uh, with materials. That is to say interact with the outer shell of the, uh, of the electrons. So we can classify materials very simply. We can talk about materials that are transparent. We can talk about materials that are opaque. Transparent meaning light can propagate through the material and it's not absorbed. Now that's actually not quite true. But what I'll, I'll, I'll stick with that as a, as a working definition as opposed to 
light which propagates in a material that gets absorbed, which in which the, the photon disappears and, is, and its energy is replaced by added energy to an electron. Or an electron changes energy and a photon appears. So in a transparent material, light doesn't disappear. But there is an interaction. Okay, we, got, we have these glass windows, light shining through it. Ah, you know, there's, it's, it's, we call it a transparent material. But if we go up to it and put our hand on the window pane, it's warm. And number two, the light propagating through the, through the, the, the window slowed down. Okay, we, we describe that with a refractive index. Refractive index is fundamentally defined as the speed of light in vacuum divided by the speed of light in that material. Now, this makes, I mean, I, 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 the more I study this, the more I think Einstein was just thinking about light. Because if you're in a vacuum, there is nothing. But if you put something, then there's some interaction between light and that matter, and that interaction slows things down. So it makes perfect sense that light can go no faster than what it can in vacuum. Because there's, how do you get less than nothing in, you know, to interact with? So the point I want to make here, other than this philosophical point about Einstein, is that the refractive index tells you how the light interacts with the material. In a transparent material, the light doesn't necessarily disappear, but it does slow down. What does that mean? That means that there's a virtual interaction, that when a photon comes along, it gets absorbed by an atom, and then it gets re-emitted. And then it moves to the next atom, it gets absorbed and re-emitted. That process takes some time. That's the refractive index. That's, that interaction is, is, is defined by the refractive index. Now, refractive index obviously are, are numbers that vary from one and bigger. Typically for transparent materials like glass, silica, yeah, it's about 1.6. A piece of gallium arsenide, uh, where, we, where we can't have fairly strong interaction, it's about three. In metals, it can be very large, 15, okay? So this will tells you the, how that interaction. It also tells you how the wavelength changes, because we know the wavelength in the material is the free space wavelength divided by n. So. And glass, nah, not a lot of change in the wavelength. Gallium arsenide, the wavelength of light shrinks by a factor of three or more. In a, in a metal, that wavelength can shrink by a factor of 10 or greater, an order of magnitude. That's something that's being, being exploited today. So that's a transparent material. So typically we'd say, oh, and I should mention, as you, as you would know, Sometimes there is some off-resonant absorption where the light is converted into phonons, basically uh, the atoms wiggling, which means that the, light, that the, the window pane gets hot. So there is some interaction. But the really strong interaction, what we call the resonant interaction, would be if light is absorbed by an electron. I should say if light is absorbed by a valence electron around the, uh, around the nucleus. And here, it turns out that we gotta have, to within the uncertainty relationship, an exact match between the photon energy and the amount of energy that gets absorbed by that, by that, uh, uh, that electron to change its state. So there, it's resonant. And in this case, if, it, if we talk about absorption, photon disappears, electron's more energetic. If we have an energetic electron and it decays down to a lower energy state, photon appears. Okay, so there's appearance and disappearance of photons we talk about in opaque materials. All right, so this is, uh, I know that, that, that this is all old to you, that uh, you know, this is recognized long ago, that you take, for example, hydrogen, and you, know, you look out in the, the, the universe, and you see very specific emission lines. Very specific emission lines, due to the fact that hydrogen have various states, say between the n equal three and n equal two state, which gives off about 1.89 eV, which happens to be a 656 nanometer photon, red. Okay, so red emission is coming about from a transition of hydrogen, you know, and you can see you're all around in the universe. So you have very discrete energy levels. So this is an interaction between light and matter where, you know, we have to match up. This is a resonant phenomenon. All right, so continuing on this comparison between uh, photons and electrons. 
we, uh, we can talk about the energy and the wavelength of both, both, both identities. In other words, you say, oh, electron has a wavelength? Yes. De Broglie told us that every particle has a wavelength. That can be really, really, really small. My wavelength is not that big. Uh, but everything has a wavelength. Photon has a, you know, a wavelength, a, you know, visible wavelength that's in hundreds of nanometer. For the, uh, uh, for any particle, if we know its energy, we can calculate its wavelength, knowing h, Planck's constant. So we uh, we can also write that energy in terms of momentum, which allows us to define a k vector for either either species. We can talk about a wave vector for the electron or a wave vector for the photon. And I will tell you that when you when you start talking about the interaction, and you start, we know we have conservation momentum for interactions. We have conservation of energy for interactions. Conservation momentum, it's very sloppy. Uh, often you see k, and you know sometimes they say k opt, meaning the optical momentum. You know, there's two momentum that you got to keep track of. All right, so we can talk about the wavelength for electrons. We can write this in terms of the mass of the particle. We can write this in terms of the momentum. For the, for the photons, we write this in terms of its energy or its frequency. Um, we can talk about the interaction between the particles. We said that electrons, they do interact. And we call that the Coulombic potential. Two negative charges repel each other. A negative charge, positive charge, attract each other. In the photons, this interaction, there is no, we, we say there is no interaction between photons, but the interaction with the material, we write down as the dielectric constant, where the dielectric constant is, is sort of a, is, 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 is the refractive index, but sometimes can include the imaginary part, which would be absorption. Okay. So, you know, if you're a physicist, you gotta write down an equation, or an electrical engineer, gotta write down an equation for everything. So, what, what are the equations that, that guide the, the, these, these, uh, these two species? Well, for the electron, it's Schrodinger's equation. Schrodinger's equation, which tells us that the wave function for that electron can be written in this way, where it takes into account the, uh, the, its energy and this moment, uh, pot potential energy potential energy and uh, momentum. For the photon, we could also write down a Schrodinger-like equation, but it really, what it turns into is, what it really is, is Maxwell's equations. In Maxwell's equations, we talk about how, how, how light interacts is, boils down to the Helmholtz equation, which is basically the, the, the wave equation. You know, wave equation, it's propagating electromagnetic radiation. These two equations are very similar to each other, but there are some slight subtleties. Um, for both species, we can write down a wave equation. Uh, I'm sorry, a, uh, 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 yeah, uh, not a wave equation, a wave function. A wave function, we're writing a wave function for the electron. Okay, when you do solid state physics, you, know, you do this all the time. You write it down, block periodic. Obviously, we have the same thing for the electron because that we, we start out with sort of a classical idea of, of propagating uh, radiation. We can talk about these two things and we're going to want to confine them. We're going to want to like hold and confine an electron or hold and confine a photon. So we need to think about the, uh, the confinement energy or the length scale of what we need to do. So. <coughs> When we're thinking about an electron, we think about its wave functions. What we find is typically, you know, a 10 eV electron has a wave function that is, you know, a few tenths of a nanometer. These are really, really short. Well, that makes sense because you know that we build when we, when we build the solids, the atomic uh, constant, the, the distance between uh, atoms is usually a few angstroms, which is an old-fashioned term, which is a few tenths of a nanometer, which means then that the wavelength of those of those clouds have to be that the electrons on those clouds have to be a few tenths of a of a uh, of a nanometer. So that, that that makes sense. In comparison to a photon that's interacting, say, with that electron, now we're a little bit longer because uh, it turns out that when we look at a lot of the valence 
I mean, you know, when you go through the periodic chart, you, you, you get all kinds of transitions, but often they're in sort of the neighborhood of infrared. So for example, a uh, 1.24 EV infrared photon has a wavelength of, I think it should be a wavelength of one micron, actually. <laughs> I can do that math. Um, so one micron, thousand nanometers, tenths of nanometers. So one thing right away is, is the length scale is very different between photons and electrons. If you're gonna try and find an electron, it's gonna be, you know, nanometers, a few nanometers at most, whereas for the photon, it'll be a few hundreds of nanometers, if not a few tens to hundreds of nanometers. Whoops. Oh. Okay. So I mentioned that we have two particles, they have energies, they have wavelengths, they have momentum. Because in momentum, we can define a wave vector for the two particles. So, you know, again, we always want to know how that wave vector varies, how the energy varies with the wave vector. Okay? So, for an electron, um, we, uh, we, you know, we can, we, we, we can write down these expressions and we recognize that the energy scales with the square of the, of the wave vector. So, typically, you know, if we draw energy of an electron as a function of K, so for example, if you're in a uh, material, we could talk about the crystal momentum that the, 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 the electron would see as it propagates through this, this material, and we have parabolic bands, okay? Now we know that it's far more, this is a very simplistic case, that when you actually build a material, that the band structure is much more complicated. It takes in all the details of where the atoms are and what the atoms are on the, on the lattice site and on the geometry and all that. But to the first order, we can consider this a parabolic, you know, near the, the brillium zone, it's, it's a parabolic dependence. For photons, uh, you know, it's always, oh, these are different things, they're different. Now the energy scales proportional to the, to the wave vector. So we have, typically, we have straight lines, okay? Where the, the slope of the line is inversely proportional to the refractive index, how much that light interacts with the material. Now, when, we, when, when the energy approaches one of these resonant phenomena, you know, when it, when it, when it approaches, if you talk about how light is propagating in a, in a, uh, in a crystal of hydrogen, uh, we would recognize that when we approach one, whatever it is, uh, six, 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 five nanometers, that we would have a very strong interaction because we, we move into something that's resonant and we'd have, get a deviation from, uh, from, from a straight line here. But typically, we have straight line uh, dispersions for, uh, for photons. All right, so let's try and confine these. So we'll talk about confinement in one dimension, two dimension, three dimension. And, and the, 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 what I'm trying to describe is I'm saying that I start off with you know, an empty box and I say that I'm gonna confine the species so it only can move, I'm gonna confine the species in one dimension. So for example, for a photon, I'm saying that, well, I'm gonna say that that photon has to remain within a plane. Okay, you can move two different directions in the plane, orthogonal directions in the plane, but it's confined within that plane. For the, uh, the electron, I would say, confined within a plane. Again, it has two free directions, but it's, this is one dimensional confinement. If we now say, nope, let's confine, confine it in two directions, for the photon, that would might be look like a piece of fiber. An optical fiber, we only, the light is only allowed to propagate in one direction. I should say in one, two directions in one dimension. Similar for the electron, we can talk about confining it to a, a, a so-called quantum wire. And if we do full 3D confinement, this is something that we might call a quantum dot for an electron or a photon dot, it's been known that, but a photon dot is something that would be a three-dimensional confinement of the photon. Now we already recognize though that even though we can talk about these, you know, increasing uh, dimensions of confinement, the length scale is very different. But this, the quantum well thickness, because the electron has such a much shorter wavelength, we're talking about Mm, few to uh, maybe 10 nanometers, whereas the planar waveguide, its thickness 
could be 1,000 nanometers or more. So how are we going to confine? Well, as I pointed out, there's three, three approaches. And I'll mention sort of the big overview. One would be for electrons, we can use Coulombic forces to confine the electron. We can use some sort of potential, or better yet, a periodic potential. We build material. We have, uh, we have, you know, crystalline materials like silicon. Well, not silicon. Silicon's boring to photonics. Well, it's not boring, but boring to me. No, it's not boring to me. It's less of interest to me than say gallium arsenide. Uh, but the uh, there's a periodic atomic potential of the lattice. Or increasingly, this is a, one of the very exciting areas, you can use metallic confinement. And we'll hear more about plasmonics. For photons, well, photons, they don't interact with each other. So we don't have a Coulomb potential, a Coulomb force that we can talk about. But we can use that refractive index. We can talk about total internal reflection. Periodic potential, we can do the same thing in a photonic material if we can modulate the refractive index. And finally, we can do the same thing for electrons where we can confine photons with metals. And I'll just give you a, a preview here. Well, actually, I may not give you a preview at all. I don't think we're going to talk about it. But, but when you get down to metallic confinement, suddenly the length scales become the same because the, the refractive index for metals is a big number, 10, 15, 30. And so the length scale of the wavelength is so short, it's comparable to the to the electron, and so you now you're talking about, you know, a, a, a widget that's the same size for both the photon and the electron. Pretty exciting. In other words, you can make things like lasers that are that are much much smaller than the cubic wavelength of light. Think about that. All right. So let's talk about confinement. Let's talk about dielectric confinement. Dielectric confinement for uh, photons. It's all based on light propagation. It's all based on Snell's law. With Snell's law, we know that if we have two materials with different refractive index, we can look at the interface between the two, and it's guided by the light, uh, the angles of reflection and refraction are guided by Snell's law, and the amount of light that gets reflected and transmitted can also be extracted from, uh, from, uh, from the Fresnel equations. Okay, so we know that you know the angle of incidence is uh, that's crap. That's not right. Oh yeah, angle of incidence is the same. Sorry, is the same as a, is a refracted angle, but the refracted angle depends on the differences of refractive index, and that can be if this if this material is larger, it can be less. So what does this mean? This means that the fish can't see the fisherman. All right. If this is water, the fish is right here, doesn't see the fisherman. Conversely, the fisherman can see the fish, but it's not in the right place. All right, and Fresnel equations will tell you what the percentage is. And by the way, uh, there is a really cool uh, simulation at this website, which shows you the angle, the, the amount of light reflected and refracted the function of angle for different polarizations, it's, it's, it's kind of neat. And it's, it's sort of like Maxwell's equations in action. All right, but that's, that's what you learned in high school. How do we use that? Well, what we use is what's known as total internal reflection. Now what we're going to do is we're going to recognize that if we get a big enough index difference between our N1 and N2, what happens is that for certain angles of incidence, if the angle is big enough that the refracted angle actually is bigger than 180 degrees. What does that mean? That means that the refracted angle is back into the material. Light doesn't come out. Okay? So if N1 is bigger than N2, if we have a big enough angle, it doesn't come out. That is what we call total internal reflection. This is the, the, uh, the, the critical uh, principle of how an optical fiber works, as I'll show you in a little while. That angle is given by the uh, sine inverse of the uh, ratio of the, uh, of the refractive indices. And it's how we can confine light. So if we want to confine light in one dimension, we just have to get a high index layer and surround it by a low, two low index layers. Now the way I like to think about this is, 
Light is fundamentally lazy because it wants to go as slow as it can. So it wants to remain in the high index, high index material. So uh, that's a quick way to remember this. Okay. Uh, so dilated confinement. We want to do one dimensional confinement of the photon. We can make what's known as a planar waveguide, which means that we'll take some material, say N2, it has a first index of N2, surrounded by N1, where N1 is typically air, for example. We might have a slab of material. And what we find is, is that we have optical, we can look at the difference between the active and refractive indices, the index difference. This is a very typical common uh, parameter we want to worry about. Uh, you know, it scales with the wavelength, free space wavelength and the indices. What we find is that there are certain um, uh, modes that will propagate in this, in this planar waveguide. In other words, not only do we confine the light, we also have now restricted what wavelengths will be allowed to propagate. And the simple way of thinking about it is, is we have this, this total internal refraction, total internal reflection, which means that wavelengths over a certain angle get reflected back in. That means that only certain wavelengths will satisfy the total internal reflection, which means that there's only certain modes that are allowed to propagate. So what could, what start out as a continuum, you know, in an empty box, you can put any wavelength you want, but as soon as you start putting confinement, you, you start putting limitations on the light that can propagate. It can be, it's confined, but it has certain allowed modes. And that's a, that's a fundamental property of all this confinement. As soon as we can find this, confine the, uh, the critter you know, onto its wavelength, of, to its wavelength scale, suddenly it, it breaks up into certain allowed propagation modes. Um, what's interesting is that the lowest order mode has no dependence on, on thickness. So when you make a planar waveguide, all wavelengths can be confined. Some not, not I mean, it's just a question of how well. So uh, one thing about a planar waveguide is, is that any wavelength is supported by any thickness of material. And this is something that is being exploited today in nanophotonics by making nanophotonic uh, 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 lasers that I'll show you in a little while. Hopefully, no, actually, very soon. <laughs> okay, I'm going a little slow. Uh, electronic confinement. This is something you're probably very familiar with. These are quantum wells. Instead of surrounding a material with lower refractive index, what we're going to do is we're going to surround a low band gap material with a large band gap material. So we're going to use potential energy to confine the electron. So we can, uh, this is just a calculation, you know, knowing at, at, at 300 K that a broken wavelength is about 30 nanometers for electrons, about 10 nanometers for holes, which is the lactive electron in the, in the material. So that means that these structures have to be on the order of tens of nanometers. Well, there's a picture of one. This is a semiconductor quantum well. Quantum well with a low energy, a low band gap energy, trying to buy two materials, two semiconductors with higher band gap material. What does that do? That creates a quantum well. So if I was to draw the energy versus distance, distance in this direction, uh, spatial dimension in this, in this direction, in this region we'd have a low band gap, in this region we'd have a high band gap, we take it to infinity, then we get confinement again. What was before, if it's just an empty box or it's just say a chunk of gallium arsenide, we could have any energy states that would be allowed to propagate. We can find that electron, boom. We now have certain allowed modes, certain quantum states that are allowed to propagate. Now if you do the, the calculation correctly and you realize that there's finite energy difference, then in fact what we find is that these, these wave functions actually penetrate into the barrier region a little bit. Uh, but nevertheless, you still have these, these uh, discrete states. Uh, same, sto whoops, same story for the, uh, for the photon. We can talk about the index rather than the potential energy or the band gap energy. So this is a high index region, low index region. We have various modes, spatial profiles of light that are allowed to propagate. The lowest order mode, which is sort of Gaussian, which means that mainly it's, it's sitting inside the high index layer. There's a little penetration outside of the, outside of the, of the material and the higher order uh, 
modes. Uh, one phenomena that's unique, or not unique, that's, that's not unique to both uh, electrons and photons are that they tunnel, they leak out. These are quantum mechanical particles. So even though we can find them, there's a finite probability that they can, they can get out. We know that for an electron, if we make a potential barrier, even if, that, if, it's, even if its energy is less than the barrier, there's some finite probability it'll tunnel through that barrier. Same thing for an electron. Even though we can find the light within an optical fiber, there's a little bit of the light that actually penetrates outside of the core. It actually, and we can actually use this. We call this evanescent coupling. And it's used for many, many different, uh, many, many different uh, devices. If you've read some of the recent uh, uh, press releases from Intel, they're talking about, oh, putting lasers on silicon. They're evanescently coupled lasers. They take a laser and they glue it on top of a silicon wafer and they rely on evanescent coupling to couple the light into the silicon. All right, you wanna do this in two dimensions? You make an optical fiber. It's very simple. You make a high index glass core surrounded by a low index, a lower index glass. Uh, in which case the light is confined in two dimensions, so it propagates down the down the fiber. All right, this was something that was discovered over hundred years ago, and it's used utilized a lot. I forgot my uh, teaching aid. I have a a Disneyland uh, thing which shows the light propagation in fiber, but you'll just have to imagine I got something on my head with fiber sticking out of it. Um, but the point is, is that light, this is a well-known phenomenon that has been exploited and it's because of this that you, you have the internet. You are able to download Netflix. You're able to send your high definition picture of your uh, girlfriend, boyfriend to your parents. Okay, another example of 2D confinement in photonics are some of these nanostructures. This is a so-called uh, total internal reflectant uh, whispering gallery mode. It's a little pedestal. And basically light runs around the perimeter of this thing because it has a high index surrounded by a low index and it's a whispering gallery mode. Similar to the, uh, to the phenomenon that you find in cathedrals except it's light, not acoustics. This is, a, it's kind of hard to see, but this is a tiny little sphere of, of uh, silica with embedded with a, with a die, and you can actually see the, the orbit, if you will, of the confined photons rattling around inside of these things. We can measure the, uh, how well the light's confined by what's known as the quality factor, which is the, uh, the energy divided by the dissipated energy. So the higher the energy and the less it's dissipated, the bigger the quality factor. Some of these sorts of cavities have quality factors measured in the millions. Okay, a typical semiconductor laser has a quality factor of a thousand. Uh, this is another example of a what's known as a toroidal uh, uh, mode, a toroidal uh, uh, cavity. You can see this is about oh, 50 or 60 net microns uh, across, and all they're really doing is they're making a tiny little racetrack around the edge that the photon can, can uh, essentially be confined and oscillate around that and it's extremely confined. So some of the things they do is they, they functionalize the surface with some kind of biological goo that can maybe detect you know, something nasty. Something nasty lands on it, changes the refractive index, changes the properties of this, of this uh, uh, cavity. You can now detect, detect those species. We can do 2D confinement for electrons, except now we're talking about nanowires. This is some examples of structures that people have grown by uh, epitaxial means. So in fact, this is a, uh, a lateral growth that uh, Professor uh, Shuling Li uh, over in the micro nanotechnology uh, uh, building has grown. So these are, these are little, little wires, little tiny little less than uh, you know, that's 100 nanometers. These are 10 nanometers or so, in, or less in size, that are, that are growing on the surface of a, uh, of a material. These can be used for confining electrons. We do 3D confinement. 3D confinement is using what we would call quantum dots. I, I, quantum comes about because every time we confine the critter, you know, whether it's an electron or a photon, you know, it, it breaks up. It, it, what, was, what the allowed energy states they used to have suddenly become 
discrete, quantized. And the more we can find it, the more dimensions and the stronger we can find it, the more quantized it gets. So we call these quantum, quantum dots. So we can talk about doing this in, uh, for uh, uh, electrons. Uh, let's see, I'm talking about optical refinement here. So I want to make a tiny little chunk of material. It's got a certain refractive index. And I want to make that material on the order of or less than the wavelength of light. So let's say I have a chunk of material that is going to absorb in the infrared, like cadmium sulfide. If I make that chunk of crystalline cadmium sulfide on the scale of the wavelength of light that's absorbed, I am not only confining the electrons, I'm also confining the photons. We make so-called colloidal dots. And so we can uh, basically, by controlling the band gap, by controlling the size of the dot, we're controlling its absorption. So, you know, same material, we make it smaller and smaller and smaller, its band gap changes. At one size, it absorbs in a red, one size, it absorbs in the blue. And this is the, an image of, you know, there's like 100 atoms in these, in, these, in these colloidal dots. So what can you do with this? Well, you can take a bunch of these dots, you put them in a fluid, put them in a bottle, and you get this, right? Certain sizes, as you change the size, the same material, same material. You change the size of material, the absorption edge changes. You can tune the absorption, the resonant interaction between light by changing the size. So often these are done with cadmium sulfide, zinc sulfate, uh, and you're shifting from 500 to uh, all the way out to the near infrared by just by changing the size of these, these dots. <coughs> okay, well, putting stuff in a fluid is, is good, but you know, an electrical engineer wants to glue a wire to it. I don't know how to glue a wire to something floating in a fluid. So what do I do? Well, I want to put it in a semiconductor. So that's given rise to what we call self-assembled quantum dots. We can now grow by basically manipulating the uh, strain uh, conditions on an epitaxial layer such that we get little islands of, of, of uh, materials, similar materials growing on them. These look a lot like little quantum dots. And if we take this material and then we say, look at this, uh, uh, luminescence, you know, we excite it and we look at what light comes off of it, we can actually see electronic states corresponding to the sizes of these dots. So by controlling the size, we're controlling the electronic confinement and thus controlling the, uh, the wavelength of light that's being emitted. Periodic. Periodic means if I'm going to do the photon, what do I have to manipulate? Well, if I'm not, you know, resonant I'm oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, I don't want to do resonant uh, interactions. I want to do non-resonant. I want to use the, the refractive index. So what I want to do, I want to take the material and I want to vary the refractive index on the wavelength scale of light. If I do that, that's the analogy of in the solid state material where I have the atoms and I have their, their coulombic potentials. They're varying on the wavelength scale of the electron. And that gives rise to all the different materials we have. Now I can do the same thing with light. So this is an example of a 1D where I have essentially layers of varying refractive index. Here I have 2D. I have holes etched in a, in a substrate. I'm looking down from the top. So this is a two-dimensional refractive index variation where the spacing between here is the scale of wavelength of, of light. Or I can do it in three dimensions. This is a structure made in, uh, by MEMS uh, technologies in, in silicon. And the idea is to manipulate the properties, the propagation properties of light in these materials. So just to show you the analogy, you know, I keep comparing electrons to, uh, to photons. Here are the electron clouds in a solid, say in a diamond structure. Maybe this is silicon. We know it has some sort of electronic band structure where we know that there's some electron states that are not allowed, they're forbidden, the band gap. Similarly, if I could make little balls of refractive index that are on the scale of the light propagating, I would similarly see a photonic band gap, certain wavelengths of light that aren't allowed to propagate in this material. 
Now, they'd be on different length scales. This is few na through nanometers. This is hundreds of nanometers. But I can combine these. So, okay, more band cap. So I can combine these. So here is my electronic energy dispersion. I showed you this early on. This is the, uh, the E versus K squared uh, dispersion for an electron in a crystal for electrons and valence band for, uh, for holes. This is the electronic band diagram. Now I take that piece of semiconductor and I drill holes. I make a refractive index variation that's periodic on the scale of light. So then I can introduce, oh, get the button, a photonic band gap right at the energy that this material will emit. If I can do that, then I can confine the photons that are emitted inside of that material. I can make a so-called photonic crystal device. So here is a periodic variation of refractive index. I have a missing hole here. That's my defect. This material has a uh, indium phosphide quantum well. It's emitting light at about uh, 1.5 microns. The light that's emitted here in this thin membrane is confined to that region by these holes. If I change the, pe the periodicity of the holes, I would change the light that's confined. And that's what I'm showing you in this, in this data. That this is the luminescence from one of these photonic crystal lasers. And each line here corresponds to a slightly different period. And you can see that I can just tune, tune the lasing wavelength by changing this pattern. So I can now exquisitely control the emission wavelength of these, of these devices. This is something that's being used for sensing today. Um, the other thing to point out is, is that this structure here is, oh, I don't know, maybe five, 10 microns in size, which would be, yeah, maybe the, the actual mode volume here is maybe 10 cubic volume, 10 cubic uh, wavelengths. By using metal, you can confine this down even smaller, even below the cubic wavelength. All right, so let me say just a few words about metallic, and then I got to finish up, because you're going to hear more about plasmonics in the in the uh, in the next talk. So we talked about using dielectrics. We talked about using periodic variation of either band gap or refractive index. The third thing is metallic confinement. Now, metallic confinement is kind of interesting. You take a metal. Now we know that light doesn't propagate in metal. Well. Actually, it does. It just doesn't propagate very far. If we take a metal and we put it on a, on a uh, dielectric material, we can actually generate a, 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 a collective excitation of electrons in the metal and photons in the dielectric. We call this a plasmon. And this, these, these plasmons are a, they're just, it's just another form of Electromagnetic radiation. It's a way to propagate light, except to using metals. And because the metal has effectively a very high refractive index, the wavelengths are incredibly short. So you, the, the feature size can be very, very small. So the, um, so the advantage of this is we can, ex we can really compress the optical wavelength. We can really make it small. You can reduce it by an order of magnitude or more. And there's a very strong coupling between the, the metal and the dielectric. Now, the disadvantage is there's a lot of absorption. You know, metals have no band gap. They're, they're, they essentially have an empty, they have an unfilled state directly above their, their Fermi level. So that means that they absorb everything. So, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of resonant interaction. But if you can overcome that, if you can deal with that, you gain a lot from this very strong coupling. <coughs> Again, this has been known forever. Uh, this is a picture I took last year on sabbatical of, of one of the beautiful uh, cathedrals in, I want to say in Belgium. I don't remember exactly where. But by taking glass and putting tiny little particles of, 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 of metal, gold, for example, you can make very, very beautiful colors 
in, in stained glass. And this is, these are plasmonic uh, phenomena. Okay, what do we use it for? This is an example of some work where they're taking very tiny um, waveguides of metal, put down very tiny la layers of metal on, on top of a semiconductor, and we can use that to, to confine the light. Similarly, you can use little dots of metal to, to propagate lights. This is thought to be perhaps a way to shrink interconnect uh, sizes down. Um, turns out that, you know, if you, uh, again, similar to the, the periodic aspects, if we look at light propagating through a hole, through a metallic hole, it turns out something funny happens when the hole is on the scale of the wavelength of light. We get a anomalous amount of light through that hole. We get more light going through a, a tiny little hole than you'd expect. So what does this mean? This means that you can take and you can, by changing the diameter of the hole, you can tune the emission of light coming through the hole. So you can see this literally is in a piece of, I think it's, uh, it's either gold or silver, you know, red and green light propagating through this. White light's being shined on the backside, but what gets propagated through is controlled by essentially the size of the hole. And then this is my uh, last, uh, my last uh, slide here. Uh, this is the so-called gold finger. <laughs> you wanna make a really small laser. I don't know why. That's one of the questions we've got to answer, one of the applications of this. But let's just say you want to do it. You want to make a really small laser, like you want to make a laser smaller than a cubic wavelength. Well, what do you do? Well, what we've now learned over the last four or five years is you take a tiny piece of, se of semiconductor and you surround it in metal. The metal basically confines the photon to whatever the size of that, of that uh, uh, piece of semiconductor that you've made because of the strong confinement of light. So even if the wavelength of light has, is 100 nanometers, you make a 10 nanometer post, it's 10 nanometers inside that, that metal coated, coated uh, material. So this is a, a metal coated little, uh, little uh, gold finger and this sucker lasers. You know, this is lasing at 1.4 microns and that line there is 10 nanometers. So you can make light emitting devices that are smaller than a cubic wavelength by using metallic confinement. So, to summarize, nanophotonics is, is the study and, you know, and in engineering, the manipulation and, and, and uh, use of the interaction between light and matter, the interaction between photons and electrons. The, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, you know, like most, anything that says nano on it, it's quantum mechanical. Quantum mechanics is the language of this, of this science and technology. So even if you're not a physicist, you want to do nano whatever, you're going to learn quantum mechanics. Um, what's interesting and what's exciting to me about this is that we can change, we can engineer how these interactions happen. We're no longer you know, restricted to whatever happened in nature or happened by Mother Nature's uh, uh, rules. We can engineer it. And so we can do things that can give rise to some really new exciting applications. One of, what, my, uh, what, what got me into this, uh, in this business was 20 years ago I started working on what's known as a vertical cavity surface emitting laser. It's a laser where in one dimension we, we confine the light on the scale of its wavelength. By doing that there's really interesting things. But today there are a billion pixels deployed around the world. It is why you have Facebook, it's why you have Google, it's, it's the internet, and if you have a, if you have a I, I used to call it a laser mouse, but if you have any mouse at all today, it's got a pixel in it. So some of these, 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 uh, these ideas that are really, you know, kind of novel and exciting can be very practical and a lot of fun. Thank you. Do we allow yeah. questions? Yeah, one or two questions. They're sleeping. I don't think so. <laughs> it's Friday morning. You had a banquet. There we go. Question on the photonic crystals, where you show the different the wavelengths where the, you vary the size of the dots, and the wavelength varies. And then in one of the wavelengths, there's a physical peak, and then very little bigger the wavelength than it did before. Why, why does it happen? That, uh, no? Yeah. 
to what five, 540. You have a peak, and then you have before that you have a, a shoulder. Oh, you are about here. Yes. So. Um, I am skipping a lot of details. These are optical cavities. So just like anytime we can find the electron and the photon, we, we basically create quantized states. Okay? But we can have more than one. And in this case, I actually have two modes that I can propagate that are, that are here. And as you can see, as I shift this, at some point, another mode comes, comes wrapping in. So these are, it's, it is, they're not necessarily fundamental single mode. Now you can, you can design these cavities to be single mode. You might not be able to tell this, but you can just see that these inner holes here are a little bit smaller in diameter than these outer holes. And if you, it, they're also slightly shifted off of the lattice position toward the, toward the crystal. This is all done to really tune the, the emission. So, you know, there's, there's, it's a lot richer than what I'm, I'm telling you here, but uh, and that, but what what's what is exciting is is that you know I can calculate I, you know we can we can calculate what modes should exist and we can exquisitely tune them and we're getting to where we have uh, fabrication technologies that allow us to uh, to uh, define and etch these holes so well that you know what we what we predict is what we get and you know the from a practical point of view and I think you'll hear more about this later uh, this morning you can now then make these emitters and you can tune them to a very specific wavelength. So, you know, you want to you wanna be sensitive to, to, to some species that emits, that, that absorbs at a certain wavelength. We can make a uh, emitter then it's, it's designed exactly resonant to that for uh, sensing applications. I mean, make it really, really small. So is this like the laser in the traditional sense of the laser where you have gay medium, you have stim stimulate the emission within that gay medium? Or yeah, I, 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 in fact, that's what was on my title slide. This is, like, as the, as you just pointed out, you need three things for laser. You need a material that, that emits light, you need a, some sort of excitation source, and you need a, a, a cavity, mirrors, you need confinement. Um, so here, this is a, this is a slab of semiconductor, you're looking down from the top, so it's very thin in, uh, you know, in the plane here. Uh, in that slab is a quantum well. So the quantum well is what I'm using to emit, uh, to emit light. In this case, this is photopumped. So I'm using another laser to pump this to generate the, uh, the emission. And the, the cavity is formed by these holes. Uh, one of the big challenges today is to make electrically injected diodes uh, in these structures. And this is very recently, there's been uh, uh, some development where, they, where people have been able to make some, some diode lasers. Um, what's interesting is, is that when you, when you, you know, these two things you need, you, you know, you got to have them. As you shrink the laser, it turns out some very practical things, like the, the Goldfinger uh, device that I showed you. This is a, uh, oops, Simic. This is a, a electrically injected diode laser. Um, but it is incredibly challenging to, to, to channel current flow into a, into a piece of semiconductor that's literally tens of nanometers on the side where you want to get you know, electrons on one side, holes on the other, and get them to recombine inside this very small, very small feature size. So the things like resistance becomes enormous because you have very small cross-section areas, which means the, the resistance you know, is, is extremely high. So from, the, from an electrical point of view, these are, uh, these are challenging devices to, to design. But from the, the physics uh, and the quantum optics point of view, they're, they're, they're very exciting. But there's lots of, lots of details. <laughs>